mountains and this beep, beep, beep little um, light went over and I wondered what that was. And then uh, I just remembered those two experiences years later because my first job in television was China Beach, which was about that nurse. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And that blinking light going over was Apollo 13 on its way to the moon, and um, which was my first film. And, <laughs> and, you know, but you look back and sometimes in the moments of your darkest despair, when everything is, you dreamed and wanted has is, is, is been taken from you, right. it's hopeless, and you think your life is going to amount to nothing, um, there might be signs or, 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 or a path opening mm -hmm. even though. You know, and, it's, it's, and that, that's like that speech I wrote for Tom Hanks at the end of Castaway, where he's saying, you know, you know, you know, as bad as it gets, he says, you know, tomorrow the sun will rise and who knows what the tide will bring. Yes. And that's how I ended up in those distant careers, you know, but was, was there were these, these markers that I didn't even know were there. Right. Uh, uh, because I was... <laughs> So um, all my thoughts and plans and ambitions had come to nothing. And, um, and so but that's kind of like now, you know, a lot of us have had to do all kinds of detours and, um, and hiatuses and, and dead ends in our personal and professional lives. And, but there may be certain things that have happened in, during this pandemic in isolation that, that, that could lead us to something even better. I mean, I'm just, I guess I'm just an optimist at, at heart. <laughs> you know, and, and my life right. is, you know, and, and again, you know, maybe it's easier for me to be that way because of, you know, white male, et cetera. But when I was lying in that rice paddy with a bunch of 19 year old dropouts, I didn't feel particularly lucky. Right. And, um, and I, you know, and, um, but those are the things like, you know, your, your different changing careers is I just feel like that's the way we have to be these days is just and to, to be awake and to look at, at, at new paths for ourselves because the thing that worries me the most is when I'm a success. Like when I became editor in chief of Newsweek, that was like one of the three or four big jobs in journalism. And it just made me nervous because I thought, <clears throat> what am I doing? Am I, am I just trying to cling to this? Right. So, successful and because it gives me status or am I really enjoying this is it really fulfilling what I want to do is it making the kind of difference and, and mm -hmm. I had like running the social security administration it was it was so bureaucratic and so much infighting and in the whole New York scene I couldn't I just didn't like and I wasn't that good at it but mm -hmm. I, I fought my way to the top of the ladder like you climb a mountain because you want to get to the top right but, then I get to the top and I thought, oh, I've climbed, That's it? I've climbed the wrong mountain. <laughs> I have to tell you about the experience I had like that. <laughs> oh, 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 tell me. No, tell me. no. It's, um, so when I was in, so I went to Vietnam last year and you and I were bonding over my experience in Vietnam. And I was like telling you, you need to go back because you went in 1984 as one of the first um, Vietnam vets to ever go back to Vietnam, right? Yeah. So me and my friend, we were in this place called Tom Cook. And uh, it's kind of like the midway point of Vietnam, right below Da Nang, but above I don't know, Hoi An or something, right? And there was this, um, there is this temple on, this, on the top of this mountain that you have to climb 500 steps to get to. And my friend from Germany was so excited. She wanted to get to this temple to see the bell, take a picture from the mountaintop, et cetera. But at the base of the mountain was this field for miles of lotus flowers growing. Oh, wow. And we stopped at the field and I was like, my God, this is so beautiful. And of course I'm a photographer. Picture? You get a photograph? I do, you know I do. Okay, yes. good. photographs of Vietnam are awesome. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I'm a, I'll send you that. That's the picture of the girl in the yellow dress. Oh yeah, took, so yeah. it's that field. So me and my friend, we went to climb these stairs. She was more excited than I was, but I was like, we're on this journey together, let's do this. And I climbed about 20 steps and I stopped. And I, I had an epiphany in that moment. I looked up at her 
And she goes, you're not coming? I said, no. I said, this is your journey. This is not my journey. I was like, go ahead and go up and meet me when you get down. And I went back to the field of lotus flowers. And that's how I got that picture of that beautiful girl in the yellow dress. And I sat in that lotus flower and I, I just, I felt in awe. And the beauty of what I was seeing from my vantage point was amazing. She got to the top of the mountain. She took her pictures. You couldn't even see anything because it was so foggy at the top. It's and I, yeah, it was and, and I just remember going, sometimes we have to take a moment and look at where the path that we're on and, and ask ourselves, is this our path or is this someone else's path that we're taking? And that was, that was one of those moments that I had for the first time in my life, instead of following someone else's path, I decided to do my own. I wasn't, I was, I wasn't ready to climb 500 steps. I didn't want to climb 500 steps. <laughs> this is not my path. I'm not doing this, but you go ahead and do it. And, you know, and, and she did. And I said, I'll be down here to celebrate you when you come back down. And that's what we did. So you had your, you had an, you had an epiphany in Vietnam, just like I did. Yes. Yeah. But you know, what I love about that story is, is it's, it's kind of what I was trying to say, but the better is that sometimes our, our peers or our culture or study points us up mountains that we're afraid not to climb because that would be a failure. Right. They're not the mountains for us, you know, like you found out. And you had the, the actual courage and, and insight to say, wait a minute, I could do this, but I don't want to because this isn't mine. And, and then you went over and found this beautiful, I love that story, this beautiful field of lotuses. And of course, they're so symbolic because the beauty growing out of the mud. And, yes. And um, they're so, that's, they're so um, iconic in that, whole, in that whole culture. Right. And, and what's funny too about that too is most times the mountains that we are told we're supposed to climb, we are not even equipped to climb anyway. I wasn't equipped. I have horrible knees. <laughs> you know? right. I'm not equipped to climb 500 steps. Like, and I, and I took the picture of what that, the, the climb would have looked like. I have an actual picture of it. There was no way I would have, I would have made it up that, that, that terrain. I wouldn't have been able to do it. And so. By the way, 500 steps just for the audience. Um, that's, that's probably the top of the Empire State Building. Yeah. yeah. That's a long way up. That's, that's. <laughs> You know, the, the stairs, you know, in Santa Monica, California, there are these stairs that the firefighters all come up to work out on. Mm -hmm. There are 187 steps. And wow, it's hard. I mean, you, 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 that's like three of those. And that's like, uh, no, no. And, and, and they're uneven. Oh, even better. so, you know, they could be this big or this small. And so that makes it even more, you know, like exhausting and the altitude is changing as you're climbing. So I was just like, nah, I'm from flat Texas. We <laughs> this is not my jam. <laughs> you know, you know about climbing because I, I I climb a lot. And yes. The statement the saying is there there are a lot of old climbers and there are a lot of old climbers, but there are no old bold climbers. <laughs> that is you know, I'm with people that have trained, and I was trying to, I lost my finger trying to, to train to climb Everest. Mm -hmm. And my friends um, in Colorado, Glenn Porsack, he was his dream for his whole life. And he worked for five years to raise the money, to train, to get the expedition. And when he got to the Hillary step, which is just the very last stop before you do the summit, storm was coming in, mm. he turned around. And, um, and the people that didn't, you know, many of them died. And so you kind of have to pay attention. The universe sometimes sends you messages. Yes. And, it, and you know, sometimes they're messages you don't even hear. Mm -hmm. you know, like, like um, and, 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 and that reminds me of, of Castaway because my real problem writing that script was how to get Tom Hanks off the island, right? Right, right. I don't mean to switch, but just because it's kind of connected. Right. right. I was going to go there anyway. <laughs> Good. Well, so, so I had all these ideas. I had the, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit team come get him. I had the Swedish bikini contest. I had the Thai pirates coming. I had, you know, 
And then I thought, no, that, you, it, it can't be someone else. He has to get himself off because it's all about. Mm -hmm. so, but I, hell, I, I had no idea. And then I realized that I, for some reason, I didn't even know, I had put this FedEx box with a set of wings on it. Because uh -huh. it was art and, and just, I wanted something that he, he just, that, that just was not useful, but he didn't open it. And, um, and I thought, well, there's a saying in, in, in writing that the Chekhov, the, the playwright did it, that if you put a gun on the, on the wall in act one, you have to fire it in act three. Right. And you can't put something of attention and not pay it off. Right. But what I realized is, is that I had to fire a gun in act three, but I didn't know where it was in the wall. You know? <laughs> um, and I thought, wait a minute, it's those wings. Mm -hmm. He's got to get off. He's got to have wings. And then, well, what kind of wings? Well, how about a, something washes up? Well, what? Can it be? You can't have a sail wash up. That's too obvious. How about a porta potty? So that from, from Bakersfield, so he can use the water, and then the wind blows it over and he gets the idea. Um, right. And that's sometimes, again, you know, you, 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 that's sort of like the, the Apollo 13 or the nurse, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't know there in my life, but they were. Right. Um, it helped me out later at a time when I thought I was a real failure, which was when I failed at Newsweek. Right. Um, I'd climbed too high, I'd risen. You know, I'd, I'd climb the wrong mountain, but mm -hmm. but I think if if we can just be open to those things, and not feel like failure is a dead end, but it's an, actually an opportunity. Yes. Make it, you know, like you quote quote failed to climb those five hundred steps. Right. But it was an amazing opportunity to turn around and see what you had walked right by, and make these beautiful images of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so. It was an opportunity, you know, to, right. to sit on and, and see. I don't know. I love. I love that story. That's yeah. Point. No, it's 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 very true. And like you were saying, so I wanted to, to hit on Apollo thirteen because when you told me that story, how you got that screenplay, I was just I just stared at you like <laughs> I was like seriously. So where were you? What was going on in your life at the time that Apollo thirteen showed up? Oh, the the script. Yeah. The opportunity to write the script. You know, you know, you know, Tanisha, you have a better memory than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot. My uh, memory is shit. Uh, you were, you said you were, you had just left Newsweek or uh, something to this effect. Something was going on, and you were staying on the sofa of your friends in Austin. You were feeling like a failure at the time. Yeah, it still doesn't ring a whole bell, but. Uh, <laughs> but yes. <yeah, laughs> Well, the, the, the person that, 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 that asked me to do it, I don't know if I told you this story, but he had been a lonely researcher at Newsweek. And, you know, just one of the many people I go up and down the elevators with and mm -hmm. 500 people working for me. And um, his name was David Finley. And I nod and, you know, because, but, you know, I was always, my schedule every 15 minutes, they'd be doing something, something, something. And um, he finally came in, he was leaving and, and, um, and, and uh, he, I said, why are you leaving? He said, because I really want to be a reporter. I said, well, look, stick around longer and maybe there'll be an opening and you can. So I got him an opening in the LA Bureau and uh. before I left. And then I never heard from him for like, I don't know, five, four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, and then he called and said, um, I'm working for Ron Howard now and uh, we need a writer with journalistic background to do this thing about Apollo 13. And as it happened, one of my old friends from Texas Monthly had made this award Academy Award nominated documentary about the Apollo mission. And I said, I'll get him. And uh, so we wrote it, we did it together. But that may not be the story you remember, but that's the, that's the only one that came to mind. Yeah, no, because you were just, you were saying that your life was at this really big turning point and you were going through a situation where you felt like, oh my God, I failed. And this opportunity ended up showing up based on, here we go, back to what you were saying earlier, based on an interaction you have with someone years before. So your gun in act one yes. showed up in act three, <laughs> right? Well, well that's, all, that's also the lesson is, you know, look, you know, you should be nice to everybody anyway, right? <laughs> uh, but you could also be nice to them because maybe someday, 
they'll call you up and give you a job right at Apollo 13. I don't need that to happen to me in my life. <laughs> you never know. Uh, you never know. Yeah, no, I was, I was, that was when I was living. Yeah, that, that, that's actually when I was, um, I was totally broke. Mm -hmm. And I was living with my um, friends and with my parents. And to make my child support payments, because I've been divorced, that's one of the quickest ways to, to lose all your money, by the way. And <laughs> I was literally looking under the seats of my car for spare change. And I broke, my, the lowest moment was when I broke my kids' piggy banks. Mm -hmm. That's about where I was when that call came to, would you, would you by any chance be interested? I said, well, I don't know. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you. No. you know, I, I had to avoid just saying, yes, you're saving my life. <laughs> no, it was, it was, but again, you know, it's, it's, um, I think it's part of it's just being open and, and in, in, in my work and is in my personal life, when I've been looking really hard, I've never found anything. True. And when I've just, and that's like, that's why I was that moment in Castaway where, you know, he's built the sails, he's got the oars and the storm comes and he loses Wilson and the sails are wrecked and he just lets go of the oars. Mm -hmm. Off to the ocean, to the universe. And yeah, and the whale appears, you know? And yes. Yeah, I remember that scene, yeah. That's what, you know, I feel about life is, is that, Maybe you know, every now and then if we're lucky, we're touched by grace or a whale or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is uh, in the form it takes. Um, and that's really, and then and partly then we try to pass it on, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I can help someone else, you know, that, and, and then that's how, that's the continuity of generations. You know, you know is it, it's, it's, it's part of, um, just the common humanity we all have and right and it's not just me 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 mine you know it's ours um and and i love that too and the, the other thing that i loved about that story was the age you were at the time and the reason why i'm bringing all this stuff up because a lot of people come to me in their late 30s early 40s and they're going through their midlife midlife crisis where they're, whereas me, I'm so used to having to reinvent myself over and over again. I'm just kind of used to it. And they're just freaking out. They're like, oh my God, what's my life's gonna do? And here you are, you're going through this process. You, you just got through the divorce, you broke, you were living with your parents. And I think you were telling me you were in your forties at the time when- Oh no, 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 I, I just turned 50. What? Yeah, I just turned 50. Yeah, yeah. That's even more amazing because you literally reinvented yourself at a time where people expect you to have your shit together, basically. Well, I hope they're still not <laughs> expecting that because, <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's just not happening. No, <laughs> it's not. Cause life can always work in such a linear way. You know what I mean? Like life is not so, like we, we're fooled to believe that life is this linear thing and it's just not.